Hey everybody, welcome back. Today, I'm here to talk to you and show you how to do paper chromatography. This is the second part of our four-part procedure about separating dyes that are from food colorings that have been mixed together. In paper chromatography, what you're going to be doing is ultimately testing out different solvents and seeing which solvents or which liquids can separate the mixture better or worse. You'll have a different mixture than the one that I have, but you're going to use the same solvents, and so you might get different results, though, about which solvents you'll ultimately want to use in column chromatography. Paper chromatography can be done on its own as a qualitative analysis, figuring out what is in a mixture, but it's difficult to isolate the samples. And what we're really doing today is just figuring out which solvents work best for the two substances that have been mixed together. Now, in paper chromatography, you've put your colored mixture on some paper, and a liquid is going to be soaked up through the paper, and it's going to carry the different substances that have been mixed, and it might carry some faster than others, depending on their solubility, depending on their polarity, which is why it relates to bond types. This is representing the paper. It's been cut to have a wedge at the bottom that would be going into the solvent. In chromatography, the solvent is always called the mobile phase. It's what is moving through the stationary phase, which is the thing that stays still. In paper chromatography, that is paper. In column chromatography, we'll see how that's different next time. So you have a container with the solvent, you've got your paper, and you put your sample, which is a mixture, at the origin, the beginning. It's important that your mobile phase is not deeper than where the sample is, otherwise the sample will just travel into the mobile phase instead of going up the paper. Over time, the solvent will get soaked up through the paper. This is the solvent front, or how far the solvent has moved, and the different substances in the mixture will travel different distances. Those distances can be measured about how far they traveled from the origin and compared to the solvent front. And this is so that even if two groups don't let their paper chromatography run for the same amount of time, they can still see how they compare to the solvent front. And that comparison is going to be done as a ratio, a calculation where you divide how far each color traveled by how far the solvent traveled overall from the origin. And that's called the RF value or retention factor. It used to be called something different and if you Google it, it might come up with something uh, that is now considered to be slightly offensive, but now people refer to it as the retention factor, or how much the substance is retained on the stationary phase. The retention factor, it's the ratio, which means you're dividing, of how far a substance traveled compared to the solvent front, measured from the origin, not measured from the beginning of the paper. And so to calculate the RF values for these different colors, it would be the distance that the green traveled divided by the solvent front, the difference that the pink traveled compared to the solvent front, and the distance that the red traveled divided by the distance that the solvent front has gone from the origin. Now the reason that different substances travel different distances is because the paper, the stationary phase, or the silica when we're doing column chromatography, is very polar. And so polar substances, if the dye has a lot of polar groups on it, are going to stick to the paper better. If the solvent is nonpolar, then it's going to carry nonpolar things with it while leaving the polar ones behind stuck to the paper more. As you change solvents and you increase the polarity of the solvent, it will move those polar substances even better. So now let's take a look at the solvents available, and that will help you understand the results that you will see. Now these are the solvents that we're going to be using for this activity. We have others that are not going to be useful based on prior experience and are not pleasant to deal with because of their odor. I've put them in this order because it's going to be important when we do column chromatography to think about them in this order. Least polar to most. The least polar solvent that we're going to use in this experiment is called ethyl acetate. It is what's called an ester compound. An ester compound has a chain of carbons 
where one of the carbons has a double bond to an oxygen that dead ends, and a single bond to another oxygen that then goes to more carbons. And that is not very polar compared to the others. The next that we will use is called acetone. Acetone is a ketone, which means that a carbon in the middle of the chemical has a double bond to an oxygen. And the rest are alcohols. Alcohols have a carbon bonded to an O and then an H. Isopropanol or isopropyl alcohol is less polar and then ethanol is more and methanol is the most polar. Water would be another very polar solvent even past methanol. We're not going to bother with water or salt water or things like that because those solvents cannot be used in a column chromatography setup. These are the ones that we can use in column chromatography, though water or salt water might separate things well in paper chromatography. We can't put them in the column and so it's not relevant to test them here. Other solvents that we have would be further on the less polar side. We have hexane, which is six carbons in a row with just hydrogens bonded to them. That is very non-polar. However, I don't think we're going to need it to separate the dyes that we have. And it has a very strong odor, almost kind of like gasoline. Gasoline has a lot of octane, which is eight carbons in a row, and that would be even less polar, though, of course, giving off a lot of fumes that would be unpleasant to do inside. Ethyl acetate and acetone are both ingredients in some nail polish removers. Nail polish removers need to be very non-polar because the nail polish is non-polar, and so it's trying to dissolve the nail polish. Acetone is in almost all nail polish removers. It has kind of a harsh odor, and so some will also have ethyl acetate, which has kind of a fruity odor. So it still does the job. It's still very non-polar, but it also gives it a little bit less of a harsh odor. Now here's what you'll need for your setup to do paper chromatography. You're going to need scissors, some parafilm, your solvent, a pencil, the paper, your mixture, some type of container, and a pipette. The paper sometimes comes in long strips or sometimes it comes to us in sheets that we cut into strips for you, though sometimes it is more appropriate to use a full sheet. When you're trying to do a good job with paper chromatography, it's important to only hold the edges. The oils from your skin can affect the way that the solvent or the substances travel. First, we're going to cut into a wedge the end of the paper. They don't have to be exactly the same. And then using a pencil to gently, faintly mark the origin. If you're going to be doing this with many different solvents, it's gonna be important that you remember which of these papers was in which solvent. And so I'm going to write that at the top that I'm using ethyl acetate. The next step is to spot your sample onto the origin. These pipettes are going to leave drops that are too big. You want the drops not to reach the edges. And so I'm going to show you how to change a regular transfer pipette into a micro pipette that will pipette small drops. You can use your thumb or some piece of metal, whether it's a scupula or the scissors, and you press onto a hard surface like the table and then pull. When things have been flattened out, you can cut where it's most narrow. And now you have a much smaller tip that will give you much smaller drops. You wanna do this one drop at a time. Now, if I put another drop on there right away, it will spread out more. And so if you're going to add another drop to make it darker, you want to let this one dry first. If you're watching this ahead of time and you're planning ahead, you are welcome to bring a hairdryer to help this process or a heat gun, which can also help this dry more quickly. Though we made these mixtures up so concentrated that it should be dark enough with just one micro drop. You do still want to let this dry, however, before putting it into the solvent. While you're waiting for one to dry, you could create your others that will go into the different solvents. 
So here I have created all of these, still waiting for some to dry, but I'm going to show you how to get the first one set up. I'm going to start with methanol, since I'm still waiting for my ethyl acetate one to dry. And you'll see that these solvents are difficult to pour. You'll find that if you're used to just pouring water or water-based mixtures, that these non-polar substances don't pour as well. What you'll do to figure out how much you want to put in, you're going to imagine that this is in, it's going to be folded over the edge so that it will hang in place. And you can see the line where the dye is, the mixture. And so I don't want the level of the solvent to be up to that line. I don't want it to be in the mixture. And so I need to look on here for what markings and where I would pour it to. So it looks like I'm going to pour it to maybe the bottom of this recycling sign. Next, you put your paper back into the container so that it's touching. Now, the solvents would evaporate, and so what you need to do is you need to seal the top, and that's what the parafilm is for. You separate the wax from the backing paper, and then you hold it in one place with one finger and stretch it and press it to seal. And this doesn't have to be a perfect seal. And you can see already that the solvent is moving up and is separating the red from the blue. As this is going, you'll want to keep an eye because you don't want the solvent front to go past the edge of the paper. And so I'm going to set the rest up while keeping an eye on this. Now that these are all set up, we'll watch them develop and see what happens as the solvent moves through the mixture.
So at this point, I think we've collected enough data to inform what we should do for column chromatography. The more polar solvent, the methanol, did separate the colors, though it carried both. It carried the red further and it carried the blue less far. The blue was more attracted to the paper than the methanol, but it did move them both. And so that's not gonna be the best way to separate these. The ethyl alcohol looks like it moved primarily the red and left the blue behind. And so that would be a good solvent to use that separates them based on their properties. The isopropyl alcohol also move the red, but not the blue. And so this would be a good place to start either of these. The acetone and the ethyl acetate did not move either. And so the acetone could be good to set up our column for column chromatography. You'll see why next time. And the ethyl acetate doesn't seem as though it's going to be useful at all because it doesn't move either dye for me. Now for cleanup, we don't want to waste these and we don't want them to go down the drain and cause there to be fumes throughout the room. And so as long as none of the dye went into the solvent, it can be poured back into the container. When you take them out, it can be helpful to mark the solvent front so I can see the ethyl acetate went all the way up to here but carried no color with it. And so last, I'm going to summarize my results on a list of common solvents about how they worked, what they separated, and that will help me next time when I prepare a column for column chromatography. Well, I hope that was all clear enough about what to do and how to interpret those results. What I saw is I'm going to want to prepare my column with acetone because it doesn't move either dye. And then I will separate the red using either of these. And once these separate the red out, I can use methanol to get the blue out of the column. You'll see how that's set up next time. So thanks again for being here and good luck.